welcome to Love Life, featuring your hosts, Rebecca Detman and Jane Donovan. The sun shines bright as it moves across my face. I feel the light. I choose interdependence, not codependence. Welcome to Love Life. I'm Rebecca Detman. And I'm Jane Donovan. And in today's show, we're doing a topic which is actually really important because I reckon completely unstatistically founded. I'm just going to throw out a fact that doesn't exist. Half the population, says Rebecca, is either, seems to me, to be either emotionally unavailable or the flip side is they're all kind of dependent, right? Now, we've explored emotional... Oh, there's probably some normal people in the middle. I'm thinking, I hang on, there's like, all our love life tribe in the middle there. <laughs> okay, so there's people like my mum and dad in the middle who have a normal, happy, miraculous marriage, the type of which no longer exists except for Jane and Simon who also have one. Um, oh, so I don't know about that. <laughs> we sweet. Oh, no. We have our issues. You guys are fine. So there's, okay, I'm going to rephrase my, my statistics. So there's a whole bunch of normals, and on either side of that, you can swing on the spectrum. You can swing to emotional unavailability, which is where you don't let anyone in. and True independence. True independence. Um, too independent, coldly independent, walls up, don't you dare come near me. I'll be around you for 15 years, but you're never going to get close to me, right? And then we swing to the other end of the spectrum. And this is a, well, a topic that we haven't explored so deeply on our show. I mean, we've certainly explored rescuing and neediness and low self-worth. But today we're going to really coin it and, and, and phrase it, in, you know, structure it in a way that we haven't done thus far so formally. And it's, it's um, I've just lost it. it codependency. Co I can't even say it because it's my own issue. No, it's, <laughs> it's codependency, which is a very, very deep-seated neediness. It's, it's the explanation as to why people will often stay in highly abusive relationships or stay with addicts or date men in jail or do things like that. And, and people say, why doesn't she leave him? Or why can't they just, why does, they, why does he put up with that? Or, you know... And, well, we're going to go into all of this why in a minute, but that is what, if you're wondering what codependency actually means, it's those kind of people. Sometimes it doesn't, it's not abuse. For example, the couple that I know I've mentioned on this show before, that they've been together since they were 16 years old, they're now in their 70s, and they can't even go to the shops without each other. They have to be in the car at the same time. If he's got to go get the bread and milk, she goes and hops in the car with him. I just really hope that they cross over to the next to the other dimension together at the same time. It's going because to well, there'll be a that very is big going to be lesson for one really, of them. Really, really tough for whoever it's is fascinating, isn't it? So we want to deeply explore today this idea. In fact, there's there's three ideas which you know have been popularly coined. So there's the idea of the independence, there's the idea of the codependence, and then what we should be moving toward as more highly spiritually evolved people is interdependence. Jane, you must get clients like this all the time. I do. Yes, absolutely. Um, the codependency thing is, it can look very different in a lot of different relationships. Correct. You might think that they're running quite independent and interdependent, but deep down there's actually massive codependency. And it might look like one person or both not being able to speak their truth within the relationship. It might be that they've convinced themselves that this is it and this is happy families, and it might be the Stepford Wives kind of married to executive man, 2.2 children, picket fence home, holiday home, perfection. It can look like um, the obvious of really toxic behaviour with each other where there is domestic violence on both sides, you know, emotional or physical. And, and all of these look like, co all of these can be co dependent mm. relationships you can have some very very strong people like you know again could speak to a room of a thousand people could run a multinational corporation but they're actually at home they're under the thumb of the other or they could never ever 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 leave they, they might have huge confidence in one area of their life but when it comes to the fear of losing love they, they, they will do anything to not lose love in, with, with that person who is role playing the adult or the parent to them and, of course, it all goes back to childhood, right? It does. Mm. It does. I don't want this to get too confused, though, with healthy codependency because we haven't really explored what interdependence looks like. And remembering that when we're observing other relationships, it's just our perception. We don't really know what's going on. Right. However, there, is, there are a lot of relationships that... And they are from people that are older that actually don't have to go to the shops together all the time, that really ha are very codependent on each other, that it's healthy and it's been built on safety and trust and honesty and integrity and reliability. And years Therefore, of experiences. 
the vulnerability mm. is at 100% to be vulnerable, mm. which then does result in a, a very deep codependence with each other. And so codependency can look like a very, very healthy, deep soulmate love. Well, maybe that's interdependence. Because each, well, each, a, a couple, uh, each partner allows the other to be completely free. As long as, here's where the shades of grey are, as long as within that codependent relationship, they are free to evolve and change. Right. Gotcha. And have their own interests, hobbies, friends, activities outside of yes. the other person. And there's no threat there. And it can't be, but hang on, we've always done it this way. You know, because now we're moving into... I like this, definitely. I'm quite excited about this. And this leads me into the question I ask teenagers all the time. Do you think I know the fucking answer? The, the question is, okay, kids, um, what is the definition of a healthy relationship? What does that look like? I mean, let's talk about it now. Jane, what is a healthy relationship? Oh, I think there's so many different ones. It depends on where you're at in the moment in your evolution. Okay, so there was a study that we both talked about the other week mm -hmm. that went up where it's researchers... where you Yeah, I loved it. It's yeah. where um, one person throws a call to action to the other. So usually in conversation, it would be something that you say... Um, the wow, what was, a gorgeous tree. Look at that beautiful moon. Look at That's right, yeah, look at the beautiful moon. And then the other person either ignores or grunts or doesn't answer or changes the topic or answers but in a non-conscious way versus somebody stopping, looking at the moon and replying. So it's a call to action. It's a call for connection. And the call is heard and the connection is made. So scientists or whoever they are, the researchers have shown that it's like 100% of the couples who have call and response yep. are the ones that withstand and last anything. The couples that didn't have that very, very simple act were all the ones that fell apart. That's right. Disconnect, That's right. no communication, exactly. no real on the same page. No That's right. All of that. Now, while I loved that and I was fascinated by the article and thought it was very clever research, you can still have two people that are called to action and responding to each other, but that doesn't mean that they've got the tools to enable somebody to be independent, interdependent and not still creating codependency. So what does that okay, mean? Okay, so that would mean that, so you've got this person that's respectful, that when you speak, they hear you and they are engaging with you, right? But it doesn't mean that they're going to engage with you with what you want. Yeah, right. Okay, so they might, you might go, that's a beautiful moon, and they might go, look at the moon and go, mm, no, actually, I don't think it is a beautiful moon. Oh, woo, there's another area. So that's, that's yeah. so the, the, the paper that came out was, was cutely written and I loved it. Did you and rush home and um, test it on Simon? I said, don't you do that to me. He did it. I said, don't you do that. That's how people end up getting separated and divorced. Don't you do that. <laughs> he looks at me and goes, bloody hell, they're in her research in our marriage again. <laughs> Jane in her bloody Facebook research. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... It was more about me being aware that I do that that I don't do that that I do hear the call to action from everybody in my life. It's you know when you say what does a good relationship look like? It's every relationship that mm. we're talking about. It's not just boy meets girl. It's or same gender relationships. It's your friendships. It's your work colleagues. It's your family. It's your children. It's everybody that you're engaging with. That you know it's being seen and heard and validated. Yeah, that's right. Um, however. Uh, while I loved this article because what they were clearly saying really is we've got one very, very fucking cool tip for you to implement in your relationship to have instant change. That's what I liked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Whereas the cool. reality is that that actually cannot ever be an indication of a relationship that's going to succeed because just because you hear somebody doesn't mean that you're not argumentative or controlling or manipulative or um, passive-aggressive or people pleasing or any of the other millions of different uh behaviors that are self-sabotaging your relationship it's a bit more complicated than yeah. that is what we're saying yeah so if we look at pure codependency look there is a, this fantastic american guy he's like a little gnome he's the sweetest old grandpa he's, and he's so american he's called counselor carl and he speaks real slow, but he has this beautiful series of videos which take you step by step through all the different levels of codependency and then how to work your way out of them. And I think oh, he wow. makes some sensational points. I have passed some of his videos on to some of my clients and some of my girlfriends and listened to them myself. Um, because he talks a lot about 
what's at the core, what's going on with somebody who's got that deep-seated neediness, that, that, that it's the fear or the hook in the other person. Even if the other person is atrocious, the codependent will not leave and they will put up with it because, of course, it, it's, a self, it's a self-worth thing, right? So it's, it's, about, it's about them not having the, um, the basic human belief that they're, what they think or feel is good enough and that should they think or feel something, it's selfish. Right. Anything that they think or feel is selfish. And, and it's an inability to, to value and respect their own thoughts and feelings. And again, it, it can sound ludicrous on paper or even intuitively. So is it that thing of, I am completely of service? See, I, I have to admit that this was, a, this was hugely me years ago. Absolutely, this was my life. It was... I just can't imagine that, Beck. And this is why You're we're so saying... so strong. This and... is why we're saying codependency is such a very veiled, hidden thing. Right. It can happen behind closed doors. I could stand in front of a room full of a thousand people, not break a sweat, no worries. But when it came to stating what I needed intimately, um, completely, and I just absolute paralysis like none absolutely nothing so i had no courage to challenge that i had no bravery i had no tools i had no the fear was absolutely completely blocking me now i'm an interesting scenario because i come from a family of two very loving parents the the typical codependent comes from a childhood where one parent was abusive or an addict so if you paint the scenario of mum was an alcoholic or dad was an alcoholic or a drug addict or a gambler or this or that, and I had six brothers and sisters and I was the oldest and I had to give up my childhood to take care of them and look after them and I had to grow up way earlier and I, I used to run around and tell the lies to the neighbours or write the note to the teacher and I covered mum's behaviour, I covered up dad's behaviour. You know, When you've done a lot of that, when you grow up and get into adult relationships, you're still enacting all of those shitty behaviors basically you're still protecting and defending the person with the problem you're playing the rescuer hardcore and you're and you're doing everything's fine here everything's fine here everything's fine here at complete self-sacrifice to yourself so i'm just having a moment i'm sitting here of um people i know whose marriages have ended and that I know that their parents, like one of their parents was an addict or an, like an alcoholic. Yeah, you can trace the pattern. And right? I'm seeing all these patterns going, wow, I hadn't heard that before. Yeah. And I can see it. So the, the codependent is in a lot of denial and their lower brain has a belief. And the belief is taking care of myself is wrong. Right. That's the belief. And so to challenge that belief requires a lot of energy and courage on many many levels and i would think they would also have a statement along the lines of love equals loyalty and protection and giving like you, you know, said before. yeah yeah it's, it's that there's a distortion of what their love statement is total distortion of love because of the base of all of that is if this is the only way i know how to keep someone around or look after them or this is what love my version of love is if i don't do this they'll leave me abandon me reject me leave me out in the cold you know it's all of that kind of fear stuff i have to run around like a chook with my head off to make sure all of their wants and needs are met because that is what love is Yes. And, and totally fine, quote unquote, so will, negating themselves. Will that. these people therefore normally choose drama partners like drama kings or queens, or um, or people that need clear rescuing? Or you know, it's like there's a lot of busyness in this relationship that they they can bring their rescuing skills to the relationship. I would say so. I would also say. If you find a normal, healthy, functioning person on the street, um, they, they, if, if, if they get a girlfriend who's really needy, they won't like it. No, they don't like it they for get, long. get rid of yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. She was too needy. I couldn't go out with my friends. She was, yeah. So the person who attracts in the codependent and keeps them for 25 years, 
loves it. They love the attention. They love because they, they they constantly they love the power because they can click their fingers and say jump and the other one goes how high? Jump, how high, jump, how high. No matter how many times they bang their, that codependent's head into a brick wall, the codependent always comes back again. Wow, how loved would you feel in in a sick mm. way? Mm. Oh my god, I'm indestructible. I can do anything. I can do anything and she'll always come back to me. So they're getting something out of it too. And, and it, it, it can be the flip side of the parenting, it, you know, a kid from a different kind of a marriage, a product of a different kind of a mum and dad relationship who's come out and and there's you know there's a lot of often manipulation and abuse of it's an abuse of trust and power because if you've got somebody who will do anything for you because they're so scared of losing you a lot of people take a lot of advantage of that they will rip you off financially they will abuse you sexually they'll have you doing acts in the bedroom you're not comfortable with but they'll make you do them because they can you know they will have you as the slave in the house you will be running that household you'll be picking up those kids you they'll be taking holidays with their mistress you'll be at home waiting for them you know, it's, and, and it can be the other way around too, guys. We can have the... Yes. Sorry to fully yes. use the cliched yes. analogy, yes. but you all resonate with the themes I'm presenting mm. here. It's probably even harder for men in this society. When you hear stories of male rape, like as in I'm talking yes. about men being raped or bashed by women, Yes, very unpopular. I did a radio segment with uh, beautiful friend Amber about that yep. um, quite a few years ago. And it was challenged. incredible, the men that rang they in. They get questioned. They get Their masculinity gets put under the fire and like, all of that. So, so these are very sensitive, delicate topics. And also it's very... It's often very hard for other people to believe it because like Jane and I said, this can be beautifully hidden. People who are survivors, particularly of real abuse, or your high functioning alcoholics, etc., high functioning addicts, are masters at, at hiding it. They can hide that bruise. They, they've got an ex a story and excuse for everything because they learned that shit in childhood when they used to have to protect mum or dad from the cops coming around, the authorities, the foster care, the, the, you know, the, the curious neighbours, the bossy auntie. They, 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 they know how to cover and protect and tell stories and not let anyone else in too closely if it threatens what's going on at home because that, as sick as it is, is the first and foremost of the first and foremost importance. Again, we're talking extreme codependency, but I know that there's women listening to this show, and I know because some of you have come to me as clients who are nodding along because you've left your marriages. Now, your marriages might not have been horrific in the forms that I'm describing, but you've been with partners who have really been very dominant personalities, and you've been the good little girls, or maybe the good little boys if there's some out there. You've been the ones who towed the line. You were the people pleasers. You grew up with a nice mum in the nice town who always said, be a lady and sit in your place and don't do confrontation and don't speak your truth and who are you anyway there's no self-worth here this is self-love self-worth stuff at its most heinous level i think which actually everything i'm doing in the hsp course which actually starts next week uh covers off on helping people with codependency right um because there's a lot of work to be done what's some basic tools perhaps that we can give people if they if they're identifying with this mm. so overcoming the denial first of all okay so owning it. is in denial yeah. I'm talking about yeah. Denial, yeah. Um, when when you feel that everything that is happening to you is because it's your joy and yet you're not happy, or you're in denial. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but, but that's but that's that's the thing. Like they've talked themselves into this is this is good. This is how it's meant to be. This is, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. They will justify. Mm, yes. If anyone asks, but how come he got to go on that holiday and you, oh, no, you've got an answer for that. Yeah, so if you're telling yourself you're happy and that this is normal, yet you're not happy. The partner will be convincing you of all of this as there's well. There's the denial. Yeah. So that's what you've really got to look at. So are you really happy? If the answer is no, you're not happy, then you need to have a look at, well, what is it that I'm not happy about? And mm. that's where that little, that's the dash in the middle that's got the denial bit in there. That's where you got to go. It's and you can just start with little things. Like start with the tiny things of, I'm, re I'm really unhappy that he doesn't let me see my girlfriends once a month when they all get together and go to the movies. So just start to own that one thing that that's not right. Mm. And whether you start to just address that one issue to see if it is workable. Look, some codependent relationships can absolutely be healed and fixed. You don't always have to run away because it's, yeah. it is about your own sense of self-worth. But you've got to start on speaking your truth, putting in your boundaries, claiming your stake on what's right for your happiness. If you've let it snowball for many, many years, that's going to be quite hard. It's going to be very hard. So that's where you just start with that one little thing. Yeah. Um, and if you want to turbocharge it, you do the course. But if you just want to do it gently, 
if you want the baby steps, then you just start with that one little thing and start the conversation of, you know, I would really like, now the, the chances are you're not going to say I'd really like, your chances, your words are going to be this. Would it be okay if yeah. you're asking permission? Now just sit in that for a minute. Why are you asking somebody else for permission? In saying, instead of saying, I'm going, I've put it in your diary that I won't be home on that night because I'm going to the movies with friends. Yeah, that sort of stuff is radical for a codependent. And Massive. I can't even tell you that the day that somebody showed me, I think I saw it written down somewhere, that I have, this sounds so basic, you'll all cry, I have a human right to happiness. I was floored. I was like, oh my God, I do. I actually, it's a human right. I mm -hmm. have that individual right to my own happiness. It was just it just sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? Mm. Unbelievable. Mm. So you need to be asking yourself, why am I doing these things? What payoff am I getting? As Dr. Phil always says, what are you getting out of being subservient, being submissive, being a doormat, towing the line? Why? Why? What are you? What's the fear? What are you most afraid of? Is it lack of love? Could be lack of love. It could be. It could be. You know that real basic need of a, a roof over your, your head mm, and food on be. the table. It could be those things, survival things. It could be but, but that thinking, you don't believe you'll survive without this person yeah, in your life. And you're so you're scared of absolute things being horrible and worse. But usually it's kind of a case of well, you know what? What you're in right now probably already is rock bottom. This is actually probably the worst it's ever going to get. And to go to a different place from here is only got to be better. It will be different, but it's probably going to be better. You know. Um, really ask yourself, really look at your behaviour of are you constantly asking for permission to be to exist? Yes. All right, that's a really big one, a big flag that you're in a codependent relationship, that you are constantly asking permission to be. Can I, can I have dinner at five o'clock? Can I go to the movies? Can I, are you okay if I watch this show? Is it okay if I go to bed now? Is it whatever? Mm. <clears throat> and I want to quote a bit that I actually wrote, um, transcripted from Councillor Carl because he just he just sums it up so perfectly. So he says, so you know, first of all, is acceptance as well. You've got to accept that you, the, you know. I remember this for me too, Jane. Actually, actually admitting it's like anything, admitting that you have a problem. Councillor Carl says, become familiar with your codependent patterns by observing them, so you can see them clearly. Now, as Jane's saying, when you first choose to break a rule that you believed help you survive as a child, it will trigger fear and shame. So your panicking wounded child, your inner child is going to start screaming, you can't do that, no one will ever love you, right? right. So you have to build a new pathway in your brain of safety. You've got to learn how to retrain the brain as to different ways to be safe. Reprogram your brain and update it to the present reality so that you feel safe as an empowered adult to take care of yourself in your relationships. And I think that just sums it up so perfectly. So we're looking at the fear that if I take care of myself, I'll be rejected or abandoned. Shame that if I ask for what I want, I'm being selfish. Mm, lots of work to be done there. And these are there? huge things. Again, I know it's what I always say women, 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 but these are big women things too. Do you know I heard something the other day as well? But we're seeing more and more men. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, for sure. And particularly because we've got so many alpha women. And, and we've got a lot of men that are very yes. passive. Yes, we do. And that really are not feeling their full manhood their full masculinity and they are yeah, we've all right in this them. and they feel like they're slaves and, and in the gay there's community. no pleasing it's a lot of abusive um, relationships in the gay community with partners as well that can yeah. go on um i saw something the other day which said that scientists have worked out that the part of the brain that worries is a reward center oh uh, yes i saw that too also guilt and shame we get dopamine we love it we love feeling guilty shameful and worrying when we worry we actually think we're doing something we're like okay well i can't do anything about it now because it's in the future but oh. if i sit here and worry i'm fixing it somehow that's the article i put up at least i'm doing on something our facebook page it, it might have been it actually. was it was the four uh four steps to happiness right 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 so yeah you so look, you, you can yeah. look on a uh, which is facebook.com forward slash love life show that's right um and that was quite interesting, wasn't it? It is. It, it goes somewhere. It was, a, it was all about the neuro, neuroscience of yeah. what was being released in our brains when we were feeling certain emotions. Yeah. And, and why we get stuck in these loops? But it also stepped through other ways that you can do it. So it had some solutions in there as well. That was a, yeah. a very good article. Yeah. So um, this is about discovering the fact, the simple basic fact, that you are worthy of being loved. And chances are, in your childhood, for me it wasn't my childhood, I was not the child of addicts or, you know, codependents. No, you've or got anything. beautiful parents. But I brought through um, some 
terrible past lives and I, I have I've worked on those for ad nauseum and I still pull up new ones I've had a big package deal like you a have. big soul theme of a lot of um, being submissive but you're the absolute walking example of you do the work and and it dissipates and you become it absolutely dissipates kick-ass. because I got such a shock when I first realized how passive you were in your home I could not believe that it was the same woman it didn't make sense to me. Yeah. It wasn't the same woman that I knew at all. Yeah, it's fascinating. And that's what we're saying. You don't know what's going on behind closed doors. No. And no. Um, oh, so what was just oh, so it's just like trust the process because it will take you where you want to go. Yes, you Beck just, is absolutely the walking role model. You just have to absolutely have to believe in this. In 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 for me, it was just the fear. It's all about in this lifetime, you have to do the thing you're most afraid of. And I'm not talking about jumping out of an aeroplane. No, this it's is speaking your truth. Stuff. For you, it was speaking so, your truth, so, the yeah. most basic truth of, I don't want to eat that. Can I go to the movies on a... Like, yeah, that's it. right. And that's where Beck started. She started with those tiny little things and felt so fearful. And then she had to gather evidence that it was okay, that what she was fearing was going to happen actually didn't mm. happen. Yeah. Um, or if it did, I learnt new tools to handle it and I got stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and this is a process for a lifetime, for maybe many lifetimes and it's layers of an onion skin but you will be amazed if you do support yourself with your tools and your healing techniques and go to your practitioners for things like this because there will be bowling balls in your body that probably have to come out big, blocked, stuck beliefs in the subconscious brain that you want to do a really big clean up job on to better support yourself to come into a more neutral energy to then be able to physically practically act out the steps in your real in your real world i choose interdependence not codependence so if you want to come up with some topic ideas for shows we suggest that you go to our love life page and you can message us there uh, the facebook page is facebook.com forward slash love life show or of course you can go to our website which is lovelifeshow.com and you can message us there um, and you can find all of our archives there and we've got a search bar on the side so if you want to type in a keyword you might want to type in boundaries or self-worth or codependency whatever it is speak your truth speak your truth truth any, anything like that you'll find whatever you need under those categories from our very very voluminous archive or episode 145 or up to I think so until this time next week have a go at really, really um, owning where you are not backing yourself and stepping up in your life and do some significant work on your deepest self-worth. Life is perfect, I'm not trying, it's just happening. And it's a beautiful day.